So when we plugged negative two to two into this one, we ended up with a narrower graph. And when we plugged in the same X values into this function, we ended up with a wider graph, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna observe what happens when we put the two on the inside, okay? Once we look at it, I'll actually show you something extra in a minute, okay? So if I put these X values, the same as we've been doing, right? But I'm gonna plug it in here. So I actually have to multiply by two first before I take the absolute value, okay? So when I plug in the negative two in there, um, two times negative two is negative four, but the absolute value of that negative four would be a positive four. And the same thing, when I plug in negative one and I multiply by two, I get negative two, but I'm taking the absolute value of that negative two. So it turns into positive two. When you do two times zero though, you get zero and the absolute value of zero is zero. And then two times one is two and the absolute value of two is also two. And then two times two, which is four and the absolute value of that four is four. Okay, so if I draw these, negative two and four, negative one and two, zero, zero, one and two, two and four. Not only do I get a narrow graph again, but isn't this the exact same graph as the other one? If you look at all of those points, every single one of those five points, they're exactly the same, right? Here you have negative two, four, and so do you here. Negative one, two, same, zero, zero, same, one, two, and two, four, okay? They are exactly the same. There's a reason for that, okay? There's actually an algebraic rule, not that we use it all too much, but there is a rule that says if you're gonna multiply two things inside the bars, you can multiply them separately by taking the absolute value of each one. So if I have something like two X, I could write that as the absolute value of two times the absolute value of X. What is the absolute value of two? Two. Mm-hmm. So you just end up with the exact same expression as this one, don't you? They are equivalent, which is why their graphs look exactly the same, okay? Now it says at the bottom, it says this, this is what I wanted us to get to. So I'm just gonna put it up just a tiny bit. Um, it says, how does each, graph in example one compare to the graph of the basic function just y equals squared or absolute value of x and we already kind of mentioned that right these two are the same so both of these made it narrower and then this one that divided by a number or multiplied by a fraction okay that one made it wider so when I get to the rules, you'll see why these are the rules, okay? Now, the rules, you notice that the ones that are on the inside, always, they can always be written in such a way that you can take them out, okay? Regardless if it's bars, if it's a square or cube or a square root or anything like that, you can always take that number out, okay? 
Um, it might look weird, but in some of the cases like the square root, but it can be possible to just have X inside the basic function and then something else multiplied by it, okay? So when I'm usually drawing these things or graphing these things, I don't usually ever keep the numbers that are on the inside on the inside, okay? Um, but they do talk about both in your book, so I have to give you the rules for both, okay? So here's what's going on. You have vertical stretching, and this is where it's gonna get really weird. I don't like this idea, this one, because it's really weird. Vertical stretching makes more sense, okay? If you're stretching vertical, so here's the um, little tip of the absolute value, right? And then it goes from a V out, okay? If you have the original that looks like this and you vertically stretch it, what it does is it makes it so that this particular X value has a higher Y value and this one has a higher Y value. So it ends up making it look narrower, right? Whereas if you multiply by a fraction, a number that's between zero and one, okay? If you multiply by a fraction, what it ends up doing is it ends up making your X value a smaller X value and this or this Y value a smaller Y value. And so it ends up looking wider, okay? So if you multiply by a number bigger than one, it'll make the graph narrower than the original, right? And if you multiply by a fraction or a decimal less than one, then it'll make it wider. Now notice that none of these numbers, they talk about none of these numbers being negative, okay? Because the negatives actually are corresponding to the reflections, which we haven't gotten to yet, okay? So the negative means something completely different, okay? But what I wanted you to understand from this is that in this rule, you are looking at that number to see if it's a number bigger than one or a number less than one, okay? If it's a number bigger than one, you know that it should be a lot more narrow, your graph. And if you know that it's a number less than one, it should be wider, okay? Technically, they call that vertical stretching and vertical shrinking, okay? And how do we know we're gonna have vertical stretching and vertical shrinking versus horizontal stretching and shrinking? is based on the location of that number. If that number is in the front of your basic function, or if it's outside the basic function, then that's how you know you're talking about a vertical stretching or a vertical shrinking. So I gave you, these are all the six, right? I gave you examples of what it would look like. The number would be next to the X and it could be considered a vertical stretch or shrink. The number would be outside the bars. The number would be in front of the x squared, in front of the x cubed, in front of the square root of x, or in front of the cube root of x, okay? That's different than when the a is inside the basic function, okay? Kind of like that other example where we did um, y equals 2x, right? We did that one. That one, the number's on the inside, okay? And so that one, it has a different meaning. So here's, I'm gonna try my best to explain this, but even myself, I have issues with this concept. I'm just being honest. Um, it's a little mind boggling, this one, okay? I'm gonna try my best. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. So with horizontal stretching, basically what you're doing is you're taking your X's and you're pulling them out. That's a horizontal stretch, okay? So I might have this particular Y value, right? Here's my graph. I might have this particular Y value, but instead of having that same X and Y together, it's now all the way over here, okay? And the same thing for this spot. Instead of it having this X value with that Y value, it's further out, okay? And so I've increased my X's by a certain factor and notice that it made it wider right? So when you stretch it, it actually makes it look wider. So it's kind of like they're backwards from the other ones. 
okay? And that's why I say they're kind of the same thing. It's just sort of like the opposite, um, but they're doing the same thing to the graph, making them wide or making them narrow, okay? Same thing would happen if I were to push the X value in, right? So I have this particular Y value, but instead of having that X value, I had one that was closer to the center. Maybe I had a X value there and there. And then now if I draw the, the little bars, it's actually narrower, right? So this one is narrower. So it's actually the opposite kind of behavior, okay? But really, is it? Because notice here, you have a factor that's a fraction. Didn't I have a factor up there that was a fraction, right? Something less than one. And both of these cases, it made it wider, didn't it? Okay. Whereas if you're multiplying by a number bigger than one, it made the graph narrower in both of those cases. Okay. But I know that there's some problems inside the, my math lab that ask you about horizontal stretching and horizontal shrinking. And how will you know if you have those is if your number is inside the basic function. And so what does that look like? It looks like the number inside with the X. It looks like the number inside the bars or inside the square or inside the cube or inside the square root or inside the cube root, okay? Now we know, look at this one. Isn't this one exactly the same, AX, AX? Those two are exactly the same way, the same thing. It's just one has parentheses and the other one doesn't. So those are equivalent to each other. We also talked about that one, how you can do the absolute value of A times the absolute value of X. And so essentially you will end up with just A times the absolute value of X, okay? Especially since all my A's are positive here, okay? We're not talking about negatives and negatives do something completely different. Here, I could square my A and square my X. And now I still have a number in the front, don't I? It's not the same number, it's A squared versus A, but it's still a multiplier in the front, which means it, it, it's still also a vertical. Then here you could write A cubed and X cubed. Here you can write the square root of A and the square root of X. And here you could do the cube root of A and the cube root of X. So notice that you can rewrite every single one of these horizontal situations into a vertical situation, okay? It's just the A number, that coefficient number may change a little bit, right? Here is A is A, but here that A turned into A squared. Here, that A on the inside turned into A cubed. That A on the inside turned into a square root of A. And here, this one turned into a cube root of A, okay? But they can all be modified so that you're just talking about vertical stretching or vertical shrinking, okay? There's not too, too many problems with horizontal stretching or shrinking, but we have to make you aware of it, okay? Now there's a really cool summary at the end of this section, but it was gonna be a minute before we get there. Okay, so we've done one topic. We've talked about stretching and shrinking, okay? So that was one of the three main concepts. The next concept we're gonna talk about is reflecting, okay? And the reflecting has to do with the negatives, okay? So when I go to example two, you're gonna see some negatives, okay? Now here's example two. Let me kind of leave that in there in case somebody's still trying to copy that down. Um, here, notice that they're using the basic function, the square root of X, okay? And notice that there's a difference between the negative on the outside in part A versus the negative being on the inside, like part B, okay? So they definitely want us to see the difference between when there's a negative on the inside versus where there's a negative on the outside, okay? Um, and if I go back to just the regular square root of X, in that chart, they used um, 0, 1, 4, 9, and 16. 
And so when you take the square root of zero, you get zero. Square root of one is one. Square root of four is two. Square root of nine is three. And square root of 16 is four. Okay. So I'm going to plot in my red pin that same graph on both. So you can compare the one they gave us with this original one. Okay. So zero, zero, one, one, um, four, two. And I don't think I'm going to be able to graph that one because it's off the chart, right? But th nine and three, I can graph. So that's what the square root function looked like. Okay. Zero, zero, one, one, four, and two, and then nine and three. So just did the same thing. So you have the original on the graph. Now we'll use these same x values, not the 16, because that one was too big, right? But we'll use those same x values and try to figure out a table for part A and then later part B. Okay. So I'm going to make my little table. And now I'm putting a negative in the front. Okay. So I have zero, one, four, and nine. So when you plug these in, I'm going to write negative square root of zero is just zero. Negative square root of one is negative one. Negative square root of four is negative two. And negative square root of nine is negative three. And then now let's plot those points. So zero, zero is right on the same spot. Um, one and negative one, four and negative two, and then nine and negative three. So it actually, it's like it flipped the red one over, right? But how did it flip over? It flipped over this line. Okay, so this is a reflection across the x axis. Okay, so when your negative is in the front like that, it is a reflection across the x axis. So if you were to fold the paper on that x axis, the original one would turn into the new one. Now for this one, I cannot use the same X values. And I'll explain why, okay? If I tried to plug in four, for instance, I would have the square root of negative four. That's an imaginary number, okay? Which means I can't graph it on a real number plane. I cannot graph imaginaries on a real plane. So to counter that negative, for this chart, I'm actually gonna use negatives. And then that negative with the negative x values should turn to positives, and then we should be able to get some, some y values instead of imaginaries. So in zero, if I make zero negative, it's still zero. I'm going to use negative one, negative four, and negative nine. So that way, when I do square root of negative whatever, the double negatives will essentially turn it back to positive and the calculator won't give me error, okay? So I do get zero for this one. So when I plug in negative one for X, right? You just get one. When I plug in negative four for X, I get positive two. And then finally, when I plug in negative nine for X, I get positive three. Okay, see if I were to have tried to just plug in one lead using the same exact X values, zero wouldn't be an issue. But as soon as I tried to plug in one, it would tell me error. That's why I couldn't use zero, one, four, nine. Okay. So all I did was use the negative partners and then the double negatives turned out positive. Okay. But let's plot these points. 
we have zero, zero, and we have negative one, one, negative four, two, and negative nine, three. And so if I draw that, I'm trying, but you get the idea. This one also had a reflection, except this time my fold is over on the y-axis. So if I were to fold my paper on that y-axis, this red part would land on top of the black part, okay? So this one has a reflection across or over, some people say the different word, the y-axis. So it does matter where that negative is. And I think the only case that I cannot take the negative out is with the uh, square root. Because normally I would want to do the square root of that number in front times the square root of x, but this is imaginary, which means I can't do it, okay? So I think this guy with the negative inside the uh, square root is the only one you can't take that number out, okay? Remember I told you on all these, you could take the number out? That's if A is positive. If A is negative, I could still do it for all of these guys, just not this one. I could do it for all of them, just not the square root. Okay. And there's um, a reflection problem at the bottom on the next page, but we already kind of answered it right there. So it says, how does each uh, graph and example to compare to the graph of the basic, right? The original square root of X, but we already showed in red what the original looked like and what this new one looked like. So we already have basically what had happened, okay? So we've already done that reflection. Now, here's the little summary box for reflections, okay? So for reflections, there's a difference between when the negative is on the outside versus when the negative is on the inside of the basic function, okay? The graph will reflect over the x-axis, meaning what's above the x-axis will go now below the x-axis, right? That is a reflection across the x-axis and it occurs when there's a negative on the outside, okay? Versus the reflection over the y-axis. So here's my graph, here's my y-axis, and then it reflects this way, okay? That happens when the negative is on the inside, okay? So reflection over the y-axis happens when the negative is on the inside. And so I just wanted to give you examples of what that looks like when the negative is on the outside versus the inside, okay? Um, so if the negative is on the outside, all of these look just like the originals, but with the negative on the outside, right? If the negative is inside, this is where I told you, you can rewrite all of them. The only one you can't rewrite is this one right here, okay? So negative x, if it's in parentheses or it's not, it's equivalent. Those are already the same thing, okay? Well, if you're taking the absolute value of a negative number, it's going to be the exact same value as the absolute value of a positive number, okay? So this little negative is, doesn't really even exist if you simplify it. And if I take two negatives and I do a negative x times another negative x, you actually get positive x squared. And if you do negative x times negative x times a third negative x, you actually end up with negative x cubed. This is the only one I can't split up because it'll cause an i, right? And here, you can rewrite the cube root of negative x as the cube root of negative one times the cube root of x, and the cube root of negative one is negative one. So this can be written as negative cube root of x, okay? I didn't show all these steps. I just told you what it could be.
Now, this talks about symmetry, but we don't really need to know about all that. If it reflects over the y-axis, it's actually what's called an even function. And then if you were to flip something over the y-axis and then over the x-axis or vice versa, over the x first and then over the y, um, and it matches whatever else is there, then that's called uh, symmetry with respect to the origin. But we don't really do much with those guys. That one requires two folds instead of just one. Now, one thing that I do want to focus on, and this is going to come back later when we get to um, when we get to our summary, okay? Notice how they tell you if you have an original point on the original graph, then the point on this guy's graph is just going to have a change in sign for the y, okay? So essentially what that means is if I had a graph, let's say I had a graph like this, and you told me to reflect this graph across the x axis, whatever these points are, let's say this is two and this is five, okay? These coordinates are two comma five. All I have to do to graph the reflection is to now put the point, the x value will stay the same, but the y value will turn negative. So it'll be the same x value, but a negative y, and then it goes this way. And you have made that reflection, okay? Similarly, if you had a graph, let's say I had, um, I don't know, we'll do a V this time. And we'll say this is one and that's two. So the coordinates here are one and two. And if I had to reflect over the y axis, the x value is what becomes negative. So now I'm over here, but the y value stays exactly as the original y value. So now it's over here, and then you have your little v going that way. Okay. Paying attention to what coordinate changes and how is really going to help us later. Okay. So we'll see these things again, like x, y becomes this and x, y becomes that for the particular reflections. We'll see that information on our summary. So we're gonna skip all of our symmetry. We're going to skip all of this whole page, page 40, page 41. They talk about even and odds at the bottom, but we don't do that. Um, this thing here as well, okay? And so what we want to get to is the shift. So I'm only going to do, I don't even think I have time to do it. I might. Let's just do this one. So if I take the original, right, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. I get positive two, positive one, zero, one, and two. It's the same graph as before. So this is the original um, absolute value of X graph, okay? But now we wanna graph this one. So we're gonna use the same X values Okay, but we're gonna see what we get. So when I take the absolute value of negative two, I get positive two. But then if I subtract four, I end up with a negative two. When I take the absolute value of negative one, it becomes one, but take away four gives me negative three. When I take the absolute value of zero, I get zero, but take away four gives me negative four. I plug in one, the absolute value of one is still one, but take away four gives me negative three. And then the absolute value of two is still two, but if you take away four, you get negative two. So let's see what happens here. We get negative two and negative two. We get negative one and negative three. 
we get zero and negative four, one and negative three, two and negative two. And if I draw my little um, arrows there, it looks like this. Now notice, this one did not get wider or narrower. It's the same exact like slopes on the, both of those lines, okay? So it did not get wider or narrower. All it did was kind of just slide down, right? And so that's called a vertical shift. If you're gonna shift up or down, it's called a vertical shift. So this guy shifted. It shifted this graph down four units. So who shifted? This graph, this one shifted the original down four units. I think I still have a little bit of time. Okay, so it's actually answering the reflection down there too. It says compare them, what's going on, right? All it did was shift it down. So what do you think is going to happen if I were to do plus four? It was shifted up four. Exactly. Okay. But again, pay attention to where this plus and minus four is located. These plus and minus fours are located outside the bars, right? So when you have a number plus or minus outside the basic function, it actually does move it up or down, depending on whether it's a minus, it's down, and if it's a plus, it goes up. But when you put plus four or minus four on the inside, it's actually not gonna be a vertical shift anymore. It's actually gonna end up making it a horizontal shift, which means it's gonna slide left to right. And this is the weirdest one because it does the opposite of what you think. This one's intuitive. You see minus four, you think, oh, it's gonna go down. You see plus four, you think, oh, it's gonna go up. When I tell you to add four on the inside, your brain's gonna to wanna to add four and go this way, but it actually goes the other way. <laughs> and when you minus four, you're gonna think, oh, well, I'm moving that way, but it's not, it's the other way, okay? So when the plus or minus four is on the inside, it kind of does the opposite of what your brain wants to actually do with it, okay? So that's usually the one where I'll have students make errors is when the plus or minus four is on the inside. I'm sure there's an example, but oh yeah, it's coming. <laughs> I just saw it. So if we talk about the vertical translations, okay? Essentially all they do is if I'm adding a number outside the basic function, so this could be an absolute value of x, it could be a square root of x, it could be x squared, it could be x cubed, it could be anything. But I'm adding a number outside, okay? All it's gonna do is add that number to your y value. And when you add a number to your y value, it actually makes it go up, right? However, if you're subtracting a number, okay, then it actually makes it go downward, okay? Because you would be minusing from all those y values which would actually make it go down, okay? Um, and so both of these, whether it's going up or down, is called the vertical shift or vertical translation. And then sure enough, don't they give me one with a minus four on the inside, right? Just so you can see what that looks like. So I'm gonna do the original again. So the original absolute value of X is gonna turn positive, 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 positive. So that's the original. And if I use my same X values, 
negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna use my calculator for this one. So I'm gonna do negative two minus four, but that's in the bars. So when I take the absolute value of this negative six, I actually get six. Then negative one take away four is negative five, but in the bars, right? So when you take the absolute value of that negative five, it turns into positive five. I'll just write it down what's happening. So you end up getting negative six, which is just positive six. Here you end up getting negative five inside the, inside the bars, which turns into positive five. When you plug in zero, you get negative four in the bars, which turns into positive four. When you plug in one, um, let me see, one minus four is actually negative three. And so you get three. And then you plug in two, you'll get negative two, which is two. And I'm gonna keep going just because I know what's going on, okay? So I'm gonna try positive three, four, and five. So when I do three minus four, I get negative one. When I do four minus four, I get zero. And when I do five minus four, I get positive one, which is still positive one outside the bars. So I'm gonna plot all of these, okay? Negative two and six. Negative one and five. Um, zero and four, one and three, two and two, three and one. And so see, if I would have stopped here at two, it would have just looked like this. And that does not look like a V at all, right? But I noticed that the numbers were going down. And so it's possible that they might go back up because it's supposed to look like a V, right? So that's why I kept going, okay? And then four, zero, and then five, one. If I plugged in six, I'd get two, seven, I'd get three, eight, I'd get four, so on and so forth. So that now it's starting to look like that V, okay? And if you look at the original compared to this one, it is not getting wide or narrow at all. It isn't reflecting over anything at all. What it did do is it slide, it slid over to the right. Okay, so this one actually shifted uh, four units, right? Because it was at zero and now it's at four. Shifted four units to the right. And what was on the inside? On the inside, it was minus that number, okay? So what do we think is gonna happen if we have this? I should write a complete sentence here. So this graph shifted this graph four units to the right. So this one should shift the original in which direction? If I have a plus, it'll actually make it go to the left, okay? Versus when you had a minus, it made it go to the right, okay? So those ones, they're a little opposite because you think minus four, it's over there in the negative direction, but it's not, it's actually in the other direction. So that's the one that I'll typically get the most errors on is the shifting to the left and the right. You just have to remember that when you're adding or subtracting on the inside, that it, it does the opposite, okay? Minus moves to the right and plus moves to the left. So I think we're almost there to where my 
Oh yeah, we're almost there. I had a goal <laughs> and I set it on my page before I came in here. And it looks like we're gonna be able to get there. So for the horizontal translations, okay. Notice that it's if it says this, okay, if it says this. It'll move to the right. If you have a minus number on the inside of whatever the function is, it will go to the right. But if you have a plus sign on the inside of whatever the basic function is, it'll actually move to the left. Okay. So you've got to keep those two. And regardless of what you're doing, all you're doing is changing the x value and not the y value. Okay. And notice that it does the opposite of what you think. If it's a minus here, look how they're adding that number to the point. Whereas if you had a plus, it's actually gonna minus that number from the X, okay? So it's a little bit different. But in both of these cases, when you're adding and subtracting on the inside, those are called horizontal translations. Now, here was my goal. My goal is just to get to here. We're not going to go into example eight yet. Um, but this is like a quick little summary, OK? So notice that they're doing the plus C outside the basic function, right? Here, they're doing the minus C outside the basic function. And when you do it outside, it's going to go up or down. Plus means it goes up. Minus means it goes down. Whereas in here, the plus C and the minus C are on the inside of the basic function, okay? And in this case, if it's plus C, then you move to the left. And if it's minus C, then you move to the right, okay? But that's a good little summary um, for now. Later, we'll get into all of the summaries. So these guys, these guys, and these guys all together, okay? I'll talk about that when we get to class the next time because I'll actually start with the summary before we go into all of the rest of the examples, okay? Now, just FYI, if you do try to do the homework, because um, some of you actually know about this stuff because y'all were answering the questions on the, the test that had to do with this stuff, correct. Um, so some of you might already know it and might want to go in there and do the work, the homework already. If you do, just be careful that you always apply the transformations in a specific order. You have to apply your reflections first, then you're shrinking or stretching the multiplication of a number. And then you have to do the translations, which is the shifting, the up, down, left, right stuff. Okay. So if you do try to go in there and mess around with the homework, make sure you do your your translations in that order okay reflect first then stretch or shank and then translate or shift okay um other than that i think i'm gonna stop here we only have three minutes left so that's plenty um we'll come back to these um examples when we come back okay if you don't have any questions for me you guys are free to go and i hope you have a good day if you do, I'll hang around, but I'll stop recording before you ask, okay? So is the homework, um, so that's not, so that's due uh, when again, like the next coming homework? Let me check. Um, I don't want to pause it because that's a good question. <laughs> so let me keep it recording. Dun, dun, dun. I'm not, I hope I'd change the dates. Let me check. So this one is due on Friday. Mm -hmm. And since it's the only it section, yeah, since it's the only section we're covering this week, it, that's the only one that's going to be due this week. Okay. Have a good day. You too. Um...